This is part four of a four-part mini-series about taking a cruise. The name of the cruise is Joko Cruise Crazy, featuring Jonathan Colton and a variety of collaborators and other celebrities. I signed up, I got a ticket, I got on the boat, we floated on the boat, went to events, went to islands. Now let's talk about the ending of the trip. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, Eric Vitello, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. This cruise, no matter how much I complain about some aspects of it, had beautiful, unique highlights for me. One of them was David Rees, who had given us the Internet Temperance League on the first day of the cruise and ran a clinic during the event called Artisanal Pencil Sharpening. Done with a straight-faced seriousness, David Rees, wearing a work apron and having multiple tools for his job, would sharpen pencils, both provided by him and by others, while lecturing folks on how to do it properly, providing a certificate of the work he had done, and including a guarantee to have pencils resharpened in the future should people need them. The combination of the performance and the result was chef's kiss amazing for me. During the opening cocktail party, when people were making announcements about how the cruise was going to go, I realized that standing behind me was Scott McCloud, the writer of Understanding Comics, one of the seminal works in sequential art, who, it turned out, wasn't one of the featured guests and just wanted to be part of the cruise. I asked him whether or not he'd be making any appearances or whether he was scheduled for anything, and he said, no, I'm just here to enjoy the cruise. The fact that somebody I looked up to who had been such an influence on my own reading and artistic work, and they were just along for the ride, I just found really inspiring. And during the stage performances given by Jonathan Colton and others, there had been many, many entertaining moments. Songs that touched us, speeches and presentations that were informative or breathtaking, and moments of musicality and collaboration that rose out of the necessity of these different bands all being on the cruise together that otherwise would have never have happened, and which we found sitting in this beautiful glass and metal theater to be well worth the price of admission and the cost of the cruise. This was fundamentally a good trip, but as I've indicated up to this point, I don't think I'll be doing it again. Joe Co. Cruises have continued for years after that first voyage, with different ports of call, different performers, and, I'm sure, a variety of experiences attached to them. But there are two main reasons why it's not going to be something I'm a part of again. The first, and most pressing, was that for 10 or 15 days afterwards, my traveling companion my partner in life, found that the slow rocking of the ship on the sea could still be felt for all those days afterwards, as if the room was moving ever so slightly, a sort of dizziness coming from the inner ear, due to being moved rhythmically back and forth for six days. When the medical results of a trip last as twice as long as the trip, that's an indication that you maybe don't want to do it. This means that if I wanted to go again, I'd be going alone. And for whatever amount I was able to sustain being on this trip, being on it alone would have been that less enjoyable. And the other reason is it's been done. By the time Joe Co. Cruise Crazy happened, I had been ten years away from another community that had meant a lot to me an online mud that I had run for ten years. And as I had changed, and as it had changed, I no longer wanted to rebuild from scratch another set 
of expectations, of traditions, of mores, of returning somewhere. It's something that happens when the same group of people or a majority group starts getting back together on a regular basis. They have expectations. They have things that they're going to do every year. They begin making jokes of what happened in previous years. They spend a lot of time explaining to people who are there for the first time how they should act or things they should pay attention to. Even the generosity of wanting to be guides for previous years builds up, ossifies, becomes another set of roles to play. And while I can't avoid that completely in life, I don't need to spend a lot of money for the privilege to do so. Commonly happening events are like a carousel, turning but yet never changing. Cases where you get on, ride along, see everything you've seen before, and then get off again. I did that with hacker conferences, with events I was hosting or co-hosting, and I have discovered, just like the difference between my ideals of a capsule hotel and the experience, that the maximum, the absolute totality of what I get out of something like this happens the first time. Life is now too short and getting shorter for me to spend time echoing what I've done before, but instead trying to find brand new things for things that scare me a little bit because I don't know how it's going to be at the end. For getting involved in projects, instead of getting involved in projects again. There is a book by David Foster Wallace called A Supposedly Fun Thing That I'll Never Do Again. It's a series of essays, but the main one, which the book is named after, is about taking a cruise. And David Foster Wallace says, in many ways, so much more than I could ever say about the experience of a cruise. What it represents that dichotomy of luxury, repetitiveness, and finding meaning in artificially created groupings and events. I can recommend reading it. But, on the other hand, there are people who have gone every year, including Jonathan Colton, who have found value going to something that they know about every year, looking forward to it, saving up for it, making it a part of their lives, of their traditions, of their family. My outlook is not theirs. Theirs is not mine. We put together in our world things that matter to us, and only us. And while we hope that others feel the same way we do, often they don't. People find value for all sorts of reasons, in social gatherings, in events, in trips, in vacations. Some people need to have that plate, that week that they know things will go a certain way when they're living through the other 51 weeks. Our destinies intertwine, and then they fly apart. We disembarked in Fort Lauderdale with no trouble. It took a while, lots of people shuffling out and filling out forms and leaving, and then we flew home, leaving with memories and connections that were a joy to have. More friends of mine would make the Joko cruise part of their world, too, either attending as passengers or, in a few cases, becoming the acts on stage. I was sorely tempted to return when I found out that They Might Be Giants were going to be one of the acts, but I found the strength not to attend that year. So what's the lesson here? Well, I'm not sure. I'm thrilled that the gamble paid off. I'm glad that I have personal experience as to what a cruise actually is. I'm happy that I got to meet Jonathan Colton and Will Wheaton and Scott McCloud and all the rest under these very unique, very interesting conditions. I enjoyed the food until I didn't. I enjoyed the sea until I didn't. And I enjoyed the idea of what I was doing until I didn't. But the memories serve to do what they are meant to do. Make me think that I had a supposedly fun time that I'm probably never going to do again. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Peter Healy, Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Matt Reynolds, Manxalot, Sean Kelly, John Sturm, Trixie the Cat, 
Dileep Reddy, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. This concludes this four-part mini-series, and I stress again for people wondering why I might venture this way. It's because I'm sick. While I've been trying my best not to lock this podcast into contemporary space, the fact is, I contracted COVID some time ago, I've had a lot of coughing, a lot of sleeping, and it appears that I'm on my way out of it as of this recording. But I have a voice that uses its entire range, and being sick under any circumstances means that I'm not working fully with the instrument that I have. However, I did feel the need, even in the face of not feeling well, of being confined to home, away from my studio, to continue to record episodes, to talk about things that I've wanted to share, to be forced to think harder of what I've experienced in life and what it all means. A true threat to myself appears to have been averted in this case. I will no doubt sound 100% the next time I record an episode. But for this moment, for sharing something with you, I can tell you that, without a doubt, this is really the best process of healing that I could have.